The Age of Crisis of my book, Rethinking Islam and the West, has a precise beginning. August the 6th, 1945. It was on this day that the American pilot, Paul Warfield Tibbetts, commander of the B-39 Superfortress, Enola Gay, dropped an atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. This blast, equivalent to the power of 15,000 tons of TNT, reduced four square miles of the city to ruins and immediately killed 80,000 people. With this cataclysmic event, humanity had crossed a threshold and entered a new age. For the first time, we were capable of destroying ourselves and all life on earth. But such visions of the apocalypse were far from the mind of the young Albert Einstein, who in 1905 was enjoying what he called his Annus Mirabilis, his miracle year. He was just 26, and he had formulated the groundbreaking equation E equals mc squared. How could he know then what his insight into the structure of matter would lead to 40 years later? He was devastated. Forever after his name has been associated with the atom bomb. The irony is that all his life Albert Einstein had been a man of peace, but through his fertile mind he became the victim of the deadly phenomenon of unintended consequences. And you could say that the age of crises is the result of the accumulation of unintended consequences, some of which took centuries to be manifested. For example, it was in 1712 that Thomas Newcomen from Devon, an ironmonger by trade and a Baptist lay preacher by calling, invented the atmospheric steam engine. The engine was used to pump the water out of the tin mines and revolutionized the mining industry. But the steam engine required fuel. The burning of the fossil fuels had begun. First coal and then oil were extracted from beneath the earth. How could Thomas Newcomen have imagined that his invention would be responsible for heating up the air we breathe, endangering our very existence? Bernard Heiner was a German physician, bone specialist and inventor. In 1830, after long years of research and development, he invented a bone saw, which he called an osteotome, and which revolutionised surgical treatment. A hundred years later, when Bernard Heiner's little saw was scaled up, it became the mighty chainsaw, the destroyer of forests. Antibiotics have always been considered one of the wonder discoveries of the 20th century. But what is truly amazing and utterly terrifying, is the rise of antibiotic resistance. As we have discovered, microbes have an extraordinary capacity to mutate and develop. Until now, they have produced multiple mechanisms of resistance to every antibiotic that has been used in the treatment of humans and animals. In our war to eliminate the microbes, we have created the superbug. Superbugs will kill us before climate change does. Dame Sally Davis, the Chief Medical Officer for England from 2010 to 2018. In 1907, Leo Hendrik Bakerland, a Belgian-born American chemist, was engaged in an experiment when he accidentally produced Bakelite an inexpensive, non-flammable and versatile plastic, which marked the beginning of the modern plastics industry. Leo Bakerland did not live to witness the catastrophe 
that his accident had set in motion. He had created a material that was practically impossible to destroy. It is now clogging up seas, rivers and landfill sites, as well as contributing to global warming when incinerated. Microplastics have taken up residence in the food we eat, the air we breathe and the water we drink. Thomas Midgley was an American mechanical and chemical engineer who was celebrated during his life and was granted over a hundred patents. During the 1920s, he produced his two most famous inventions, the introduction of lead in petrol and CFCs in refrigerators. For 80 years, lead was pumped out of vehicles all over the world, poisoning people and the environment, until its devastating impact became generally recognised and it was banned. CFCs were banned when it was discovered that they were creating a hole in the ozone layer. Midgley had more impact on the atmosphere than any other single organism in Earth's history. J. R. McNeil, environmental historian. Paul Herman Muller received the 1948 Nobel Prize for Medicine for his discovery of the insecticidal qualities and use of DDT in the control of vector diseases such as malaria and yellow fever. With its success in dealing with the mosquito, DDT rapidly became the pesticide of choice in the home and on the farm. Rachel Carson was an American marine biologist, best-selling author and conservationist. Her book Silent Spring, published in 1962, led to the banning of DDT and the establishment of the US Environmental Protection Agency. Silent Spring meticulously described how DDT entered the food chain and accumulated in the fatty tissues of animals and human beings, causing cancer and genetic damage. The book's most haunting and famous chapter, A Fable for Tomorrow, depicted a nameless American town where all life, from fish to birds, to apple blossoms, to human children, had been silenced by the insidious effects of DDT. Rachel Carson and her book received a barrage of attack from the chemical industry. A spokesman declared, Miss Carson claims that the balance of nature is a major force in the survival of man, whereas the modern chemist, the modern biologist, the modern scientist believes that man is steadily controlling nature. Well, most of the birds and insects on farmlands under agribusiness are now silent. But the mosquito is making a comeback, having mutated into a super mosquito. Norman Borlaug was an American agricultural scientist and plant pathologist, celebrated as the father of the Green Revolution. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. However, the higher yields and greater prosperity that the Green Revolution promised have proved to be illusory. The Indian scientist and conservationist Vandana Shiva, who more aptly named the Green Revolution the Chemical Revolution, has meticulously recorded its disastrous journey through the farming communities of her country. Few people at the time considered the profound social and ecological changes that this revolution heralded among peasant farmers. The long-term cost of depending on Borlaug's new varieties resulted in reduced soil fertility, reduced genetic diversity, soil erosion and increased vulnerability to pests. Not only did Borlaug's high-yielding seeds 
demand expensive fertilizers. They also needed more water. Both were in short supply. The revolution in plant breeding has led to rural impoverishment, increased debt, social inequality, and the displacement of vast numbers of peasant farmers. The political journalist Alexander Coburn wrote, Aside from Kissinger, probably the biggest killer of all to have got the Nobel Peace Prize was Norman Borlaug, whose green revolution wheat strains led to the death of peasants by the million. Yet another of the modern miracles has turned out to be a nightmare. Some 300,000 farmers in India have committed suicide over the last 25 years, many by drinking pesticide. The next of our crises began some 500 years ago in the Vatican. Jakob Fuga, a banker and merchant from the city of Augsburg, convinced Pope Leo X, who was from the Medici family of bankers, to lift the ban on usury. In his book, The Richest Man That Ever Lived, Greg Steinmetz writes, Leo's decree was a breakthrough for capitalism. Debt financing accelerated. The modern economy was on its way. The world is facing a new crisis caused by an explosion in debt. So warns William White, the banker who famously predicted the crisis of 2008. The present global debt stands at $253 trillion. Debt means spending the future to maintain and enhance the present. We have now mortgaged generations yet to be born. It is predicted that by 2030, the world will need to produce 50% more food and energy, together with 30% more available fresh water, whilst mitigating and adapting to climate change. This threatens to create a perfect storm of global events. Sir John Beddington, Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK Government, 2008 to 2013. Meanwhile, the destruction of the rainforests continues unabated, with its disruption to wildlife and the dangers that this embodies for humanity. For it is out of this disruption that the pathogens cross over from animals to humans. As more and more forests are cleared around the world, scientists fear that the next deadly pandemic could emerge from what lives within them. The National Geographic magazine, 22nd of November, 2019. We are turning the world into a perfect petri dish for the creation of new pathogens. In 2012, Sir Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal, co-founded at Cambridge University the Centre for the Study of Existential Risks with the following mission. We are an interdisciplinary research centre within the University of Cambridge who study existential risks, develop collaborative strategies to reduce them and foster a global community of academics, technologists and policy makers working to safeguard humanity. Our research focuses on biological risks, environmental risks, risks from artificial intelligence, and how to manage extreme technological risks in general. The warnings from scientists, economists, and numerous other experts of the extreme dangers of our situation are becoming ever more strident. And yet, it is out of their laboratories and way of thinking that the crises have arisen in the first place. One may well ask, how can the mind that produced the crises solve the crises? The contention of my book is that it cannot. The modern mind is incapable of holistic thinking, and its solutions are always going to be subject 
to unintended consequences. We need a fresh perspective, a new narrative, if we are to understand the reality of our situation. Without this understanding, how can we know how to act? The proposition that I have put forward in my book is that our age of crisis is the direct consequence of the narrative of progress. With its focus on scientific innovation, technological development and economic growth. We are surrounded and enmeshed in this narrative, which has woven all of history into its story. We need to free ourselves from the shackles of this idea and find a new narrative that makes more sense of our past and the escalating crises that are now engulfing us. We need a criterion to replace progress. And I believe this to be the criterion of balance. Few would argue with the proposition that we are out of balance with the natural world and that this disequilibrium is now reaching critical stage. Balance is manifested in many ways in cultures and civilizations. And when things are out of balance, sooner or later they fall apart. In pre-modern worlds, a fundamental principle of existence was the balance between the heavenly, human and earthly dimensions. The principle of balance was at the heart of both Confucian China and Islam and explains the stability and longevity of their civilizations. In this comparative study of Islam and the West, I shall draw on the Islamic articulation of the concept of balance, represented by the Arabic term mizan, which can be translated as balance, justice, measure or harmony. It is a term which contains a spiritual dimension that our secular understanding of balance does not convey. The primacy of mizan in Islam is enunciated in the 55th surah of the Quran, Al-Rahman, the All-Merciful. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسن بان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء رفعها ووضع الميزان ألا تطغوا في الميزان وأقيم الوزن بالقسط ولا تخسر الميزان والأرض وضعها للأنام. In these verses, the beauty and all encompassing nature of Mizan is majestically revealed. All existence 
has been created in balance, and humanity has been commanded to maintain the balance. The centrality of Mizan can be seen in the following formulas or triads. The first of these relates to the levels of existence or being and is called the ontological triad. Before modernity, all cultures and civilizations believed in the sacred origin of their worlds and in the relationship that had to be maintained between the unseen, the human, and the material realms. Christianity and Islam shared an understanding of these realms. Islamic civilization retained the balance and hierarchy within these levels, remaining within the confines of this triad. In the West, however, the collapse of Christendom eventually led to a loss of belief in and knowledge of the spiritual realm. This loss of relationship with the unseen made it impossible for ethics and morality to be objectively rooted, or for the integrity of nature to be fully recognized outside of human use and exploitation. This breakdown of hierarchy and balance has led to our age of crises. The second formula is what I have defined as the vocational triad. The scholar and priest, warrior and ruler, merchant and craftsman can be understood as archetypes and the relationship between them helps define the character of civilizations. In Islam, the prophet, blessings and peace be upon him, was the exemplar. Encompassing the knowledge of the scholar, the justice of the ruler, and the integrity of the merchant. With this example, a state of balance, interdependence, and fluidity was established between the vocations, creating a stable and sustainable civilization. A very different unfolding took place in the West. For a thousand years, Christianity provided a spiritual culture that was intense and single-minded in its vertical aspiration and overwhelmingly dominated by the priest. The Gothic cathedral is the perfect manifestation of this heavenly quest. With the Renaissance, the warrior hero replaced the saint at the apex of society. Humanism was born and monarchs became absolute. With the classical palace, replacing the Gothic cathedral. The French and American revolutions against the tyranny of monarchs and the fanaticism of the churches and the industrial revolution brought the merchant and modern scientist into power. And the machine world we now inhabit was their creation. The West has proceeded from intense spirituality through humanism to the all-encompassing materiality that now surrounds us. Each vocation in the West created its own world, and what we call the open-plan brain of the modern contains all three worlds, somehow coexisting together, but in a permanent state of conflict and contradiction. Lastly, we have the Platonic Triad. Plato formulated the principle of the need to balance three faculties within the human being, those of intellect, anger and desire. This principle was adopted and developed by both Christianity and Islam. If intellect controls anger and desire, there is peace and harmony. If anger or desire control intellect, conflict and chaos ensue. This triad relates to the individual soul and is also mirrored in the vocational triad, with knowledge corresponding to the scholar, anger to the warrior and desire to the merchant. The Platonic triad has remained fundamental to Islam and Christianity 
being central to the disciplining of the soul. However, the reign of the warrior in the West unleashed a flood of violence and anger upon the world, and this was joined by the unfettering of desire with the ascendancy of the merchant, finally leading to the overturning of Christian morality. Nearly a hundred years ago, the Catholic historian Christopher Dawson warned that modern man had cut himself off from the heavens and cut himself off from the earth. We are now experiencing the full impact of this alienation from what sustains us spiritually and materially. We're drowning in a tide of chaos and confusion. And yet humanity remains wedded to the idea of progress. Once we have freed ourselves from the narrative of progress and see the world through the lens of Mizan, the reality of our situation comes into focus. Instead of the triumphant journey of the West to a material paradise, the trajectory can be seen to lead inexorably to our age of crises. At the same time, a new understanding of Islam and its civilization emerges. In episode three, we explore the role of the reasoning mind in the West and how when it became detached from religion, it brought into being the machine world, setting in motion the escalating crises that now encompass us. This fresco in the Basilica of Santa Maria Novella in Florence, entitled The Triumph of St. Thomas Aquinas, depicts the celebration of his grand synthesis. The Summa Theologica, which St. Thomas is presenting to us, is a magnificent creation and became the philosophical and theological foundation for the Catholic claim for the universality and completeness of the Christian revelation. If we look carefully, we can see crouching at the feet of the saint three figures. These depict the heretics. In the centre, flanked by Nestorius and Arius, is the Muslim philosopher representing Islam, which was perceived by the Catholic Church to be a Christian heresy. However, it was the Muslim philosophers that had provided St. Thomas with the knowledge and the tools to construct his remarkable edifice, and the same knowledge and tools would enable his detractors to dismantle his grand synthesis. But what was this grand synthesis? It was the resolution of the tension between faith and reason. Aquinas compared faith and reason to two books, the Book of Revelation and the Book of Nature. Both books were written by God, and consequently they had to be compatible. Faith and reason are both ways of arriving at truth, and since all truths are harmonious with each other, Faith is consistent with reason. They are parallel ways of arriving at the truth embodied in the Christian revelation. But the grand synthesis could not hold. For William of Ockham, the incarnation was contradicted by logic. Only faith, he asserted, can give us access to theological truths. The ways of God are not open to reason, for God has freely chosen to create a world and establish a way of salvation within it, apart from any necessary laws that human logic or rationality can uncover. He urged that philosophy and theology 
be divided into separate branches of study. The Catholic Church was now divided between those who followed Thomas Aquinas and those who followed William of Ockham. Western Christendom was ready for its cataclysmic splitting asunder. It was Martin Luther, a follower of Ockham, who carried his thinking to its logical conclusion and anathematized reason. Reason is a whore, the greatest enemy that faith has. It never comes to the aid of spiritual things, but more frequently than not struggles against the divine word, treating with contempt all that emanates from God. Martin Luther banished reason from religion. Some two hundred years later, the philosopher and Lutheran pietist Immanuel Kant expressed the dilemma he faced. I had to deny knowledge, to make room for faith. The reasoning mind was now free of the shackles of religion and could become its own master, the only arbiter of reality. The French philosopher René Descartes heralded this triumph with the famous statement, I think, therefore I am. But the reasoning mind, divorced from its proper context in metaphysics and revelation, could only understand the world as quantity, in terms of numbers. Descartes wrote, In my opinion, all things in nature occur mathematically. With me, everything turns into mathematics. The mathematical precision of Sir Isaac Newton's account of the universe led to the invocation of his theories to support a range of mechanistic views. This depicted the material world as a great machine that is essentially self-sufficient, a clockwork universe. From the imaginings of the isolated reasoning mind to the realization of the machine world we inhabit was but a small step. However, there needed to be another ingredient to create the mind that could engineer such a transformation. For a thousand years, the monasteries had been at the heart of Western Christendom. But with the Reformation, the life of monks, nuns and friars came to a sudden end in Protestant lands. What followed was the greatest destruction of a culture wrought upon itself ever to have taken place. In England, nearly a thousand monastic sites were destroyed. The contemplative heart of Christianity was ripped out. But what followed was truly extraordinary. Having made a ruin of our own living world, we dug up a civilization that had been dead and buried for a thousand years and idealized it. We gathered up the broken sculptures, friezes, inscriptions, and columns, and placed them in temples, which we called museums. There we could preserve and study the artifacts that constituted our new culture. Instead of belonging to a world which formed us from inside, we became the detached observers of a dead world that could only be brought back to life through our imaginations. This change in perspective occurred dramatically in the realm of art. Christian art surrounded the worshipper who was the recipient of the stories and teachings it conveyed. With the introduction of perspective, the isolated work of art was born, and the human being became the detached observer, no longer belonging to a holistic culture. Man had become the measure of all things, usurping God's sovereignty. The detached modern mind, saturated in hubris, that could only see the world in terms of quantity, was born. Sir Francis Bacon chillingly expressed this new mind. My only earthly wish is to stretch the deplorably narrow limits of man's dominion over the universe to their promised bounds.
Nature will be bound into service, hounded in her wanderings, and put on the rack, and tortured for her secrets. The rape of nature had begun. The world would now begin to experience the thonic principle, that the deeper you go into matter, the greater the forces that are released. With the extraction of the fossil fuels from the earth, the Industrial Revolution erupted. The splitting of the atom ushered in our age of crises, and at CERN, with the Large Hadron Collider, the delving ever deeper into matter continues. The devastating results of our uncharted journey into matter are all around us. At Cambridge University, half the scientists, such as those belonging to the British Antarctic Survey, are dealing with the unintended consequences of previous scientific breakthroughs, whilst the other half, such as the Nanoscience Centre, are busily producing the next generation of unintended consequences, which, if you follow the thonic principle, are likely to be even more devastating. The fruitless quest to understand and control existence through its material manifestation continues unabated. Shortly before his death, Stephen Hawking was asked, In physics, there are these two huge theories, Einstein's theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. The holy grail for some time has been, how can we draw these two together? It's what people refer to as the theory of everything. Do you think we will ever achieve that? Stephen Hawking answered, I think we will eventually discover a unified theory, though it may take longer than the 20 years I predicted 45 years ago. The scientists' search for this holy grail cannot be realized and must end in failure. The completeness they are seeking in the material world is not there, because the material world belongs to a greater reality. The whole can contain the part, but the part cannot contain the whole. But what is profoundly significant, and is central to my book, is the desire for oneness, wholeness and completeness that resides in the human mind. It failed to achieve satisfaction in Christianity, and the modern scientists are engaged in a never-ending quest. In episode 4, we will explore what happened in Islam. On completing episode 3, I had intended to go straight on to the ascent of Islam, in which we explore the trajectory of knowledge and follow what actually happened to the reasoning mind. In Islamic civilization. However, there is a major obstacle blocking our path. The myth of the Golden Age of Islam. This 19th century Orientalist invention has taken hold of both the Muslim and Western imaginations. What has resulted is a distorted and dangerous idea of Islamic civilization, which has become generally accepted. Thomas Babington Macaulay was the historian who became the popular evangelist of this narrative. We see him here immortalized in stone, standing on his plinth in the chapel of Trinity College, Cambridge. He believed in the utter superiority of the European over all other nations and that the English were the greatest and most civilised nation the world had ever seen. He lived when England was at the zenith of its power, with an empire that surpassed that of Rome. It was the centre of commerce and the workshop of the world, having plundered Bengal of her wealth and destroyed her renowned cotton manufacture in the creation of the Industrial Revolution. 
Macaulay embodied the absolute belief in the Enlightenment idea of the ever upward march of human progress. This narrative divided history into three periods ancient, medieval, and modern. The seminal events in this narrative were the fall of the Roman Empire and the Renaissance, with the rebirth of civilization. This rebirth set in motion a series of religious, scientific, political, industrial, and social revolutions leading to the constantly changing world we now inhabit. The thousand years of Christendom were relegated to a dark age of ignorance and superstition. It was into this narrative that Islam was introduced. The story went that Islamic civilization during Europe's dark ages kept alight the knowledge of the ancients and enjoyed a golden age. President Obama, in his Cairo speech of June the 4th, 2009, perfectly enunciated the golden age of Islam thesis. As a student of history, I also know civilization's debt to Islam. It was Islam at places like al Azhar University that carried the light of learning through so many centuries, paving the way for Europe's renaissance and enlightenment. Islam and its civilization were seen as tributaries feeding the river of Western civilization, a bit player in the narrative of progress. And yet the Cairo audience seemed happy and indeed honoured by this designation. But the story continues. Having received the torch, the West embarks on its dynamic arc of progress, and Islam and the Muslims enter centuries of stagnation and decline. President Truman, in his inaugural speech on January the 20th, 1949, divided the world between the developed and underdeveloped nations, which, with America's help, would become developing nations. The call now came for the Muslims to awaken from their long slumber and catch up with the West. With 9-11, the floodlights turned on Islam and the Muslims. The deadly sting in the tale of the Golden Age narrative was seized upon, by those who went into the attack on Islam and everything it stood for. The idea that the Muslims had produced nothing for nigh on a millennium was grist to their mill. Fantastic theories emanated from scholars who should have known better, and others whose writings were fueled by anger, hatred and ignorance. Books, articles and social media posts poured forth upon an ill-informed public reeling from 9-11 and in need of a scapegoat. One of the most pernicious books focused on a rationalist school of theology whose role in the development of Islamic thought is complex, requiring deep knowledge of the subject, which the author clearly lacked. The promotional literature for the closing of the Muslim mind, subtitled How Intellectual Suicide Created the Modern Islamist Crisis, stated in this eye-opening new book, foreign policy expert Robert R. Riley uncovers the root of our contemporary crisis. A pivotal struggle waged within the Muslim world nearly a millennium ago. In a heated battle over the role of reason, the side of irrationality won. The deformed theology that resulted, Riley reveals, produced the spiritual pathology of Islamism and a deeply dysfunctional culture. This insidious idea was given further credence by the philosopher Sir Roger Scruton when he wrote, If Riley is right, as he surely is, then the resentment that animates the Islamist terrorist is to be blamed not on our success, but rather on Muslim failure. The failure is the effect of an act of cultural and intellectual suicide which occurred eight centuries ago. But why was this Golden Age narrative, which was such a distortion of what actually took place, and left Islam and the Muslims dangerously exposed to ridicule and attack, 
so warmly received by both Western and Muslim thinkers when it was introduced during the 19th century. I would argue that it was because of the overwhelming power that modern science enjoyed and the unwavering belief that this was the natural development of humanity's shared progress. For the West, the golden age of Islam provided a past for modern science, a link through to the Greeks and Romans. But as we saw in episode three, modern science had broken with the past. An example of how modernity cut itself off from everything that preceded it is clearly illustrated in modern architecture. Le Corbusier proposed knocking down a whole district of Paris and erecting his tower blocks, and he called his villas machines for living in. For reformist Muslims, the golden age of Islam was an attempt to claim the roots of modern science. But modern science has no roots and bears no relation to how science was understood within Islam. Mustafa Sabri was the last Sheikh al-Islam of the Ottoman Empire. He was educated in the traditional system and stood out as one of the few scholars who challenged the reformers in his writings. But his warnings were drowned out by the headlong rush to embrace the new world of knowledge that was being propagated in the West. He saw clearly that modern science had provided the power for the West to vanquish the Muslim world, but that the reformers had mistaken martial victory for intellectual victory. Sheikh Mustafa Sabri knew that the traditional Islamic system of knowledge fulfilled all the requirements necessary for humanity to flourish both in this world and the hereafter. In episode 5, The Ascent of Islam, we examine what actually took place in Islamic civilization and begin to uncover the glorious knowledge system that was eclipsed by the false promises of modernity. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Qul huwa Allahu ahad Allahu samad Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad صدق الله العظيم. In episode 3, we saw how the desire for oneness, wholeness, and completeness resides naturally in the reasoning mind. This desire for wholeness, which the reasoning mind seeks, is at the very heart of the revelation of the Holy Quran and is clearly enunciated in the surah that we have just heard recited. Ikhlas is the 112th surah of the Quran and its English meaning can be translated as purity of faith. However, it is often referred to as the absoluteness, the unity, the oneness, the declaration of God's perfection. It was through the seal of the prophets that this perfection was manifested to humanity. The prophet Muhammad, blessings and peace be upon him, was born in Mecca, a trading station on the route that connected the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. Mecca was also the sacred centre for the Arab tribes, who would come together in their annual pilgrimage to the Holy Kaaba. 
For 13 years, the new community of Muslims was under siege, enduring extreme hardship and persecution. In this hostile environment, sustained and encouraged by surahs that were revealed during this time, and the example and guidance of the Prophet, blessings and peace be upon him, the nascent community was taught patience and trust in God and compassion for their persecutors. In this cauldron of oppression, the Muslim inner life of peace and beauty was forged. With the Hijra, the migration to Medina in the Christian year 622, the Islamic calendar and era began. For ten years the Prophet led, governed and guided his community in the light of the revelations that continued to be transmitted providing the framework of how to live as a society in a state of submission to the will of God. This teaching was crystallized in the five pillars of Islam, which provided the foundation for the religious life of all Muslims for all time. First amongst them is the attestation of faith, that is, bearing witness to the unity of God and the prophethood of Muhammad. The testimony of faith grounds all human experience in a recognition of the oneness of God and provides the model for human existence in the person of the prophet, blessings and peace be upon him. Then come the canonical prayers, to be performed five times each day. The cycle of prayers ensures for the Muslim that all of human life is permeated by a living connection to God. This is followed by the zakat, which is the annual tax paid by every wealthy Muslim and used to assure an equitable society. Zakat blesses the wealth of the rich and provides succor to the poorest. Fourthly, we have the month-long fast of Ramadan a festival that combines ascetical self-denial, the celebration of giving, the communal partaking and the breaking of the fast, as well as a sacred commemoration of the revelation of the Holy Quran, which began during the month of Ramadan. Finally, there is the Hajj, or pilgrimage to Mecca, incumbent upon a believer if he or she is able, which brings together Muslims from across the globe, in a visible testimony of unity. These five pillars provide the framework for the Islamic way of life. They are common to all Muslims and have never changed. They provide a unifying structure that guides believers through the cycles of the day and the year. After 23 years, the Holy Quran was complete and the Prophet departed this world, leaving a community immersed in the revelation and ready to carry Islam onto the world stage. The Formation of Islamic Civilization Within a hundred years of the establishment of the community in Medina, the Muslims had control of an empire that stretched from Spain to India and the borders of China, and contained within it the richest provinces of the Byzantine Empire and the entire Persian Empire. Exposed to a world of many ancient cultures and civilizations, a remarkable process of synthesis was set in motion. A great movement of translation from Syriac, Greek, Persian, Chinese and the Indian languages into Arabic took place as Arabic became the universal language of scholarship. The West mistook this period, when the knowledge of the world was being sifted and sorted, for the golden age of Islam. It was, in fact, the formative stage, and what was remarkable was the universal civilization that would emerge. However, the Enlightenment thinkers in Europe saw only its achievements in the material sciences, which were indeed considerable. Geometry came from the Greeks, and the zero which made possible advances in the mathematical sciences came from India. 
This led to major developments which included the creation of algebra. The Greek system of medicine was adopted and improved, with many works being translated, resulting in the magisterial work in this field by the polymath philosopher Ibn Sina. Astronomy and astrology came from the Greeks and Persians, and its development is one of the great achievements in Islamic civilization, with a number of new stars being discovered and joining the records in the Arabic language. Remarkable work was done in the field of anatomy, especially in the case of optics. The knowledge regarding the land and the growing of crops saw major advances under the Muslims, as new cities required to be provisioned. This development is well recorded in the Filaha texts, produced between the 9th and 13th centuries, which recorded the revolution in agriculture that took place. The Muslims also improved on the ancient world's knowledge of mechanical devices, especially those required for water management on the land. The administration and statecraft required to manage the complexity of empires was gleaned from Byzantium and Persia. This meant that there was minimum social disruption to the existing societies when the Muslims became the rulers. The Muslims in this great process of sifting and sorting received from the worlds they encountered only what was useful and could enhance the Islamic way of life. The material sciences did not take off on their own as they did in the West. Rather, every innovation was absorbed and integrated and became part of a whole that once established was maintained and renewed by each generation. As an example, the astrolabe came from the Greeks, was improved by the Muslims, and then remained the same for a thousand years, performing the same task perfectly. The Sharia formed the backbone of Islamic civilization and is a term that has been thoroughly misunderstood in the West. It is usually referred to as Islamic law and tends to be viewed simply as a penal code. But this is only one aspect of a vast, all-encompassing, spiritual, moral and ethical system of how to live on this earth as a Muslim. It defines the relationships and obligations that obtain between mankind, his creator, his fellow human beings and the creation. It is a comprehensive framework for the maintenance of mizan, or balance within society. It was produced by scholars and came into being through the process of instructing, guiding and counselling the community. The Holy Quran, the Hadith of the Prophet and the five pillars of Islam would provide the unchanging kernel out of which the civilization would grow. When this stable, permanent, sacred core engaged with the great civilizations of Afro-Eurasia the dynamic process of transformation took place, as the knowledge required to move from the tribal worlds of Arabia to a fully formed universal civilization was assessed, assimilated and developed. It took some 500 years for Islamic civilization to be fully formed, by which time the Sharia reached its maturity, colleges and educational institutions were founded, craft and merchant guilds set up, and the tariqas to regulate the Sufi path came into being. Islamic civilization reached a state of mizan that enabled each and every Muslim to live their lives in a spiritual, intellectual, moral and material environment that reflected the divine unity. The Golden Web Islam spread west to Timbuktu in Africa and east as far as Beijing in China. As we have demonstrated, what was perceived by the West as a golden age was in fact the formative stage in the creation of a new universal civilization. This brought into existence a new world of interrelations and connectivity across Afro-Eurasia which can certainly be called a golden web. And no one has left a better record of this extraordinary world than the great Moroccan traveller 
Ibn Battuta. He set out from Tangiers in 1325 and spent the following 29 years travelling to every part of Afro-Eurasia where Muslims were to be found. It has been estimated that he covered some 120,000 kilometres. When Ibn Battuta set out on his epic journey, it was only 67 years since the terrible destruction of Baghdad by Hulagu Khan, the son of Genghis Khan. According to the Golden Age thesis, the Muslim world is supposed to be declining and stagnating, but in actuality it is expanding rapidly, with many new cities being founded. The year Ibn Battuta set out, two of the most influential figures in the formation of Islamic civilization in India passed away, the great scholar and saint Nizamuddin Aulia, and his disciple, the scholar, poet, courtier, soldier and musician, Amir Khusro. Their importance in the culture of India is so great that to this day the saint's mausoleum, where they are buried side by side, is visited by both Muslims and Hindus. During Ibn Battuta's travels, Kara would experience the visit of Mansa Musa, the Sultan of Mali, and his caravan of gold that so astonished the European world. The Sultan returned to Timbuktu with scholars, craftsmen and architects, turning his capital into a great centre of learning with universities and libraries which attracted scholars from far afield. With the building of the great mosque, an indigenous Islamic architecture took root. The central lands which had been devastated by the Mongols were now recovering under their descendants, who had converted to Islam and became great builders and patrons of learning and the arts. This coin was struck in the reign of Abu Said Bahadur Khan, during which trade flourished in the cities of his sultanate. Ibn Battuta described him as one of the most beautiful of God's creatures, a man of culture, a poet and a musician. Forty-nine years after Ibn Battuta returned to Tangiers from his travels, the first of what has become known as the Ming Voyages, initiated by Emperor Yongle, set out from China for the Indian Ocean. A further six voyages would take place, the last returning to China in 1433. The fleet consisted of huge treasure ships and hundreds of support vessels, with thousands of personnel, including sailors, soldiers, merchants, scribes and diplomats. The world was not to witness another such armada until the First World War. The construction of the fleet and the execution of the voyages were under the command of the legendary Muslim Chinese Admiral Zhang He. Muslim Chinese merchants organized the trade missions, and Muslim Chinese scribes recorded the voyages. The Armada was engaging in the golden web of the Indian Ocean and China Sea, where Muslim merchants now inhabited all the maritime ports. In his groundbreaking work, Trade and Civilization in the Indian Ocean, an economic history from the rise of Islam to 1750, K. N. Chowdhury follows the course from a world in which peaceful exchange and collaboration between nations is the norm. To the advent of the European powers, when competition and conflict becomes the order of the day. The Golden Web was the result of the great spread of Islam, which took place after the formation of the civilization and after the fall of Baghdad. There are, I believe, two crucial factors in this dramatic and far reaching expansion. The first of the migrations and conquests of the nomadic Turks and Mongols that took place over centuries from the grasslands of Eurasia. Nothing can compare with the rigour of the way of life of the nomads of the steppes, whose existence was encompassed by the extreme heat of summer and the numbing cold of winter. The seasonal migrations, when large communities with their livestock were on the move, required formidable leadership qualities, detailed knowledge of the tribes encountered along the way, 
and the precise information of the terrain covered with the location of wells and watering holes. Mistakes could be costly, even leading to the destruction of the tribe. In such an environment, great leaders were created and large confederacies formed. At the time of the birth of the prophet, blessings and peace be upon him, the greatest of these confederacies straddled the entire steppes from Mongolia to the borders of Hungary. This Turkish empire lasted a hundred years before it broke up. There followed the great migration of the Turks and Mongols into the settled lands. With their conversion to Islam, their strength and formidable powers of leadership greatly increased the area under Islamic rule, witnessing the flowering of many states and empires, and ensuring for hundreds of years the protection and support of the Islamic way of life and its civilization. However, it was the merchants who carried Islam far beyond the reach of the Turks. Unlike previous civilizations, in Islam the merchant was held in high esteem. They were deeply attached to their religion and would gather in the mosques when eminent sheikhs visited their towns and cities. Often they were well versed in scholarship and the practice of Sufism. Through their example, they carried Islam across deserts and oceans to the farthest reaches of Afro-Eurasia. Islam expanded through trade and was brought back to its center through pilgrimage. This was a golden web with the holy city of Mecca at its heart in which all who participated were enriched spiritually, culturally and materially. The Grand Synthesis For Aquinas, the Grand Synthesis was the resolution of the tension between faith and reason. For the Muslim thinkers, it was the arrival of all of the human cognitive powers in the contemplation of divine unity. With the soul's receptivity to revelation, the mystical cognition of the spirit, the reasoning of the mind, and the acuity of the senses, arriving at their ultimate destination in a state of complete submission and eternal peace. The reality of revelation was so powerfully established in the hearts and minds of the Muslim through the Holy Quran, the Hadith of the Prophet and the practice of the pillars of Islam that it was recognized as a direct source of knowledge. In Islam, the cognitive faculties are focused upon comprehending, experiencing and absorbing the revelation. Every Muslim, and indeed every human being, to a greater or lesser extent, engages all of the faculties. However, some are more developed in a particular individual than others. Those with active reasoning minds tend towards philosophy, theology and the material sciences. Those endowed with mystical cognition are drawn to Tasawwuf or Sufism, whilst those who have heightened sensory perception become artists or craftsmen. For the revelation to be manifested as a civilization, the forms and methods for each of the cognitive faculties required to be fully developed. Imam al Ghazali refers to the wisdom of the craftsman and it is through the elevation of the senses that artists and craftsmen participated in the synthesis of knowledge. Just as the Sharia enshrined the way of life for the Muslim, the craftsman fashioned the environment in which the Islamic way of life could be lived. It took some 200 years for the new forms that were able to manifest the revelation to evolve. With calligraphy, and the art of illumination, the sacred nature of the Holy Quran became visible. The integration of calligraphy and geometric pattern produced an environment that allowed the Muslim to be constantly within the experience of the divine unity. At the heart of the Islamic city was the mosque, where all the crafts were engaged in a glorious display of beauty and harmony to celebrate the central role of mankind, the worship of Almighty God. 
Once the principles and methods of the arts, crafts and architecture were established, they were realized wherever Islam took root. But the universality of Islam was revealed in the way in which all the various cultures, inhabiting different kinds of environments, expressed their unique qualities. A perfect balance between unity and diversity can still be experienced through the great mosques that straddle Afro-Eurasia. The crafts of husbandry and farming produce gardens of refreshment and contemplation, and a fruitful environment that provided the food and materials necessary for the support of cities, towns and villages. The knowledge of those who tended the land increased from generation to generation as they collaborated with nature to produce sustainable systems that constantly renewed the fertility of the earth. The crafted environment of the city and its hinterland provided a stable world in which generations of Muslims, and indeed all those living under Islam, could lead lives fully connected to and integrated in the spiritual and material realms. The masters of mystical cognition are those who, from the 12th century on, have come to be known as Sufis. Sufism embodies a subtle understanding of the inner makeup of the human being and a system of practices that focus on disciplining and purifying the soul, that may bring the believer to attain sincerity of worship and a state in which he or she might be granted experiential cognition or mystical knowledge of God. There were many great mystics in early Islam. What took place over time was the development of systematic ways of teaching the science of Sufism. Many great works were composed as guides, such as those of Kusheri in the 11th century or Umar Sahrawadi in the 13th, whilst poetical works, such as Attar's Conference of the Birds and Rumi's Masnavi, used stories to provide people with ethical and spiritual insights into themselves, as well as encouraging them to aspire to attain the sublime realities. With the huge expansion of the world of Islam, which took place following the formation of the civilization, tariqas were formed, which provided an institutional framework with networks which spread from Spain to China. Sufism, which began with a sheikh surrounded by his small circle of followers, ended up being accessible to any person who wished to follow the path to purify themselves and attain inner peace. In Christendom, it was in the monastery that this peace was sought by the monks and nuns. In Islam, it was available to all, from courtiers to scholars, merchants, craftsmen and husbandmen, both men and women. Finally, we come to the reasoning mind, which, as we have seen, has the potential to cause such havoc. This was the preserve of philosophers and theologians and had a long and arduous journey before reaching its goal. When the prophetic age came to an end and the scholars were left to fend for themselves, an immense intellectual ferment took place. Restrictive positions were taken by the Mutazilites who claimed for reason the ultimate authority. The Hashwia who insisted on the literal interpretation of the text, and the Bartanists, who sought only to understand the inner or symbolic meaning of the Qur'an. The Mariological principle that the whole can contain the part, but the part cannot contain the whole, was tested. However, the parts claiming the whole were absorbed into the mainstream or left on the periphery. Many great thinkers contributed along the way to the realization of the grand synthesis. Foundations were laid by Ibn Sina and Imam al-Ghazali. Ibn Sina transformed philosophy and developed a universal science of metaphysics that could encompass all of the sciences and simultaneously attain the heights necessary for an adequate intellectual treatment of revelation. Imam al-Ghazali's monumental work recognized the mystic path 
as reaching the highest knowledge of God attainable, within a framework that acknowledged the value and relationality of every field of human knowledge. This chart shows some of the scholars who contributed to the crystallization of the Grand Synthesis, first among whom were Fakhruddin al-Razi and Ibn Arabi, known forever as the greatest master. Arazi applied his epoch-making intellectual power to a synthesis of Avicenna general metaphysics and the revelatory principles of Kalam theology. He created a new, all-encompassing Kalam, in which all knowledge was shown to be part of a single truth. His work paved the way for the great summers of the 14th and 15th centuries. Ibn Arabi for the first time fully encompass philosophy within his mystical vision, and thus contracted a sublime marriage between them. By the 15th century, a synthesis of Akbarian, Avicennan and Razian thought was complete. Powerfully exemplified in the works of later thinkers, like Mullah Fanari and Tashko Prasadi in the Ottoman world, and Shah Waliullah, and the Farangi Mahal school in the Mughal world. The hierarchy of knowledge had been established that took in the revealed sciences alongside all the branches of philosophy and mysticism. The reasoning mind had reached its goal. The cognitive powers were now one in their contemplation of the divine unity. This is beautifully expressed in the following passage. The way of deductive inference and the way of contemplative witnessing. Both of the two ways become resolved into the other, such that the person in possession of them both becomes a meeting place of the two seas. That is, the seas of deductive inference and contemplative witnessing, or knowledge and gnosis, or the observed world and the unseen world. Sublime intelligence, perfect synthesis, the mind at peace. We shall show them our signs on the horizons and in themselves, until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. A nation justly balanced. The revelation of the Holy Quran was transmitted through the seal of the prophets and engaged all the types and vocations of humanity according to their roles in the realization of a universal civilization. The scholars who were the guardians of the Sharia ensured that the practice and understanding of the revelation was maintained from generation to generation and were the guarantors of the continuity and stability of the civilization. The warriors and rulers who came and went as dynasties rose and fell were the protectors of the realm the maintainers of justice, the patrons of learning, and the builders of mosques, madrasas, and those institutions which supported the Islamic way of life. The merchants of Islam traversed the trade routes by land and sea, and carried Islam with them. Cities and their markets flourished, and the wealth of the merchants benefited the whole community through the charitable trusts which came to hold as much as half the wealth of the society. The wisdom of the craftsman and the husbandman produced and maintained a beautiful, stable and sustainable environment which reflected the divine unity. The revelation reached and nourished every part of society. Thus have we made of you a nation justly balanced that ye might be witnesses over the nations, and the messenger a witness over you. The Destruction of Islamic Civilization For more than a thousand years, Islam succeeded in creating a stable, sustainable, universal civilization which maintained the Mizan. Generations of Muslims cherished their holy book, loved their prophet, were happy in their religion, were at home in their culture, and found peace in their civilization. Then a force rose up in the West, 
which at first challenged, then overwhelmed, and finally all but destroyed Islamic civilization. The trauma was so great, and the power of what has replaced their world so complete, that the Muslim memory of the past has been almost entirely erased. But the sacred core of Islam remains completely intact and fully operative. At this time, when all humanity is racked by crises, suffering and fear, many Muslims are finding inspiration and solace in the thirteen years that the Prophet, blessings and peace be upon him, spent under siege and persecution in the holy city of Mecca, and are attempting to follow his example by responding with patience, forbearance, compassion and love for Almighty Allah's creation. Just as Islam was perfectly manifested in its origin and in its formation as a universal civilization, so it is perfectly formed as a haven from the storm that humanity is now passing through. This series, and indeed my book, could not have been completed without the collaboration and support of Hassan Spiker. His work following the trail of the great scholars of Islam is shedding light on the grand synthesis, which is transforming our understanding of Islamic civilization. Later this year, inshallah, his book on the subject, which is the result of more than a dozen years of research, will be published. I would also like to thank Imam Ali Tos and my son Ali Kila for their beautiful recitations from the Holy Quran. Finally, I have been incredibly fortunate in being able to work with Colin Ramsey and Dragonlight Films in the production of this series. He has greatly enhanced what started out as a basic slideshow which I was to present to live audiences on my book launch tour. Many thanks, Colin, for a very rewarding collaboration.